We are a uh, nonprofit uh, donation and grant fund organization. We have several Please projects. give us money. <laughs> what she said. Thank you for not making me do that. Um, <laughs> we have a donation box in the back. We have uh, bookmarks, uh, some books, other stuff. Maybe some leftover T-shirts um, for donations and stuff as well. Um, we do on our website, you can also donate to PayPal as well. If you don't need an account, just a checking account or a debit card number or a credit card number. Um, take whatever you can get, um, fives, tens, twenties, hundreds, whatever you can get. <laughs> <laughs> our laughing time around, we're getting better at it. <laughs> First day, um, <laughs> And we, you know, if you want to come back on another night, uh, where it's maybe a little less crowded, um, there's flyers on the side there, and uh, starkids.org, you can set up your own um, night to come out and see the stars. John Ensworth's going to do a little warm-up here for you before and Deborah and Rebecca come up and do their main presentation. And I'm going to get out of the way right now. Uh. And you'll, you'll introduce them after I'm done? OK. We're, we're figuring this out. So hi, everybody. Welcome. I don't know. Did you take a hand, uh, show of hands, how many people are brand new? Yeah. Whoa. Wow. Yeah. 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 We didn't have room for them earlier. <laughs> So um, my name is John Ensworth, and uh, I, I do a little warm-up uh, Astro News brief before our main speakers most months. So that's what I'm doing right now. We have not switched the talk on you. Don't worry. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, a dipping star in Hubble. And you can actually grab a volunteer after tonight, if it's clear, and go out and take a look at Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice is, by some accounts, between 613, 818 light years away. It's really difficult to determine this distance because this is a kind of a funny star. It's got a lot of gas that is puffed out into its surroundings. It is a red giant and it is close to the end of its life. How close, you ask? Well, we don't know. Um, it's about 10 to 21 times the mass of our sun, so it's a monster ejecting atmosphere out like this is an artist's representation of what's going on here. That's art, not an actual picture. Um, we believe that this star is about eight to nine million years old and it probably will, can only live about nine million years. So we're close. Uh, what's interesting about it, the reason we're talking about tonight is it's up here in Orion. I've got my Orion shirt here on this as an audio visual aid. Um, got uh, the three stars in the row for the belt, got the shoulders of Orion up here, his kneecaps down here, and this star up here in the upper left from your point of view is Beetlejuice, and it is getting dimmer. It's done that before, so don't panic. Um, it's gone uh, from about the 10th brightest star in the sky down to about the 23rd, and that was by December 19th. Um, Paul, I brought him as a, as a plant in the crowd. You, you, you said it got measured at 1.4 magnitude? So maybe a, a couple ranks lower yet. I don't know where it is in the overall brightness of stars but tonight, but uh, it's dim. Uh, it's the faintest that we've seen in the last century or more. We do expect it to go supernova in the next 100,000 years. Maybe that includes next week. That's impossible. <laughs> next week is in the next 100,000 years. If it does go off, it'll be about half the brightness of a full moon, what we expect, and you should be able to see it in the daytime. Of course, now it's up at night, so you can't see it in the daytime. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, astronomer in New York, uh, has called for amateurs to at least observe it. Take a lot of observations, take images if you have cameras, get the surrounding stars in. Everything could be of importance if this thing goes boom. So, all right, uh, next little story is Hubble. Hubble telescope has been up, believe it or not, 30 years as of April 24th is when it was launched. And it is still going strong, giving us a lot of science. 
And the scientific contribution of recent is looking at how light goes around big galaxies and clusters of galaxies in between very distant light sources like this quasar and us over here, there's Hubble. And we can see the gravity bends the light around it, big space-time warping of light. And these are our little Einstein rings and crosses and interesting patterns here. And what we're trying to figure out here is what is this dark matter stuff that we don't understand? It's called dark matter because we don't understand it. Um, most of the universe is made up of stuff we don't understand, dark energy and dark matter. Um, we have not detected what dark matter are, uh, is yet. We expect it to be some interesting particle, but it doesn't fit into our current understanding of uh, subatomic particles. We don't have an empty spot in our, our models to uh, figure out what this is. So one of the debates going on among astronomers uh, are that the, this um, dark matter might be hot. It might be very diffuse, spread out um, in, in space. Or it could be cold. It could be kind of clumpy and tight and kind of holds to it. Uh, its own around the galaxies it's associated with. And what Hubble has helped us understand is it's clunky <coughs> and kind of dense. And so, yes? Is that a clumpy and dense? Yeah, yeah clumpy. <laughs> yeah. Very um, But what that also, uh, I'm not going to go through all this, but also does is it keeps astronomers fighting and uh, sending nasty emails to each other because it's contributed in this calculation of how fast the universe is expanding. And a bunch of studies have values up here with errors that are only this big. And a couple of good studies looking at the early universe and how the uh, Big Bang afterglow uh, looks today put really good numbers down here. This is a big error, and this makes astronomers very uncomfortable. So it didn't solve it. It put another chip over here on this side, and we'll have to figure out a way to solve this problem. Maybe you'll get that in a future astro update. And finally, uh, Yerk Yerkes, is that how you say it? Yerkes Observatory does plan to reopen. This is a story from Astronomy uh, Magazine. Uh, it's a 122-year-old observatory. It's contributed uh, in the early days to, with 170,000 photographic plates. Closed to the public October 2018. You got to see it right before it closed. Yes. Mine to our director. Um, and what's going on is they're transferring ownership from the University of Chicago to something that they formed called the Yerkes Future Foundation which is surprisingly difficult to say in front of people. Uh, and they started doing that in November of last year. So going forward, they hope to reopen. There's a really nice picture of it. Yeah. That's a classic. Right? They don't build them like that anymore. So. All right, any questions? Yes? So it is the largest refractor telescope in the world. It has a 40-inch optic on the very end. And the tube is about 65 feet long. And the dome that you saw, the big dome in this picture, was 75 feet in diameter. It's really big. 75 feet long. It's Parks and Open Space. Parks and Open Space 
in the Natural History Program Specialist. But what that means is she has a really cool job of planning out astronomy events in the natural areas. So she's going to talk about that in conjunction with Rebecca, um, I'm forgetting the last name, Dickens, 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 and uh, from the Sierra Club. And Rebecca is a professor at CU Boulder, and she has been a volunteer director of the Sierra Club Boulder, called the Sierra Club Indian Peaks Group in Boulder. And they are here this evening to talk about protecting our night skies. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you. So, wow, that's loud. Um, it's good to see all of you here. And um, just to start out and get you thinking, I'm going to put this, this next slide up here. I don't know if I can get it to move. Let's see. Here we go. There we go. Welcome to the dark skies. <laughs> so, uh, why do you think dark skies are important? Just tell me some reasons that dark skies are important. Just shout them out. Light pollution impedes our ability to see what's out there. Okay, very good. What else? Is it just astronomy or is it other things? Yeah, for the animals. Animals, wildlife, right. Um, what about people? Yeah, people help. We're going to talk about all those different things and why darkness is important for her many, many reasons and share a little bit of, with you about what Boulder County is doing with some dark sky projects and what you can do as a citizen to help things be better. So, to start with, I work for Parks and Open Space and open space we often think of um, preserving for reasons like uh, recreation for people and wildlife um, views. You know, this, you don't you don't have a lot of developments on open space, or no developments on an open space. So you have views of the mountains and views across prairies and things like that. Um, and we save it for agriculture and a lot of other reasons. And those are all great reasons. It's all kind of horizontal. But you, if you think about it, we're also preserving the skies, which is a vertical view. Uh, because when you've got open space and you don't have a lot of lights in development there, you're also preserving the skies, which is a thing that people don't often think about, but it's pretty important. This picture right here was taken by Mike Lohr. He's one of our employees with Parks and Open Space. And um, he's just a guy that goes out and works on buildings, but he has this hobby of photography, and he's fantastic. And he took this picture at Walker Ranch up on Flagstaff Road. Does anybody been to Walker Ranch in here? Okay, it's a beautiful spot. And this is the homestead at Walker. And there's the Milky Way right above that. Um, so there are, there are places we can get out here and see things like the Milky Way and lots of stars, which we should be grateful for. This is one of those maps you've probably seen in various iterations and places. Um, I'm going to help you hold this for a second. Okay. So on this map, it's just interesting. It shows you where the light pollution is in the country. And you can easily find, you know, the big cities. Like, what's this right here? Dallas. Dallas. We've got San Antonio. Houston. What's this? Atlanta. New York. Chicago. Minneapolis. What's this? Yeah, that's us. This is the front range. And we've got Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle up here. We're lucky we still have a lot of dark spaces here in the western part of the country. But what's this spot up here in North Dakota? Oil field? Yeah, couldn't click the. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, there is. That is oil fields, oil and gas. So it's not just lights and um, things like that in cities. It's also things like oil and gas that contribute to the light pollution as well. And you can see here's Yellowstone. Look how dark that is. Isn't that great? There's Yellowstone right there. So there's a lot of different things. Go ahead to the next one that contribute to the light pollution. Um, this is one of the progressive maps. This was done in 2001, so it's a little out of date, but it's interesting. This was the late 1950s, kind of looking at what light pollution looked like. We go to the 70s, and then we go to 1997 here. And this is projected for 2025. So what you gotta think about is not just 
you know, the increase in population and more lights in cities, it's also the type of lights we're using. So that's one thing to think about too. And it doesn't have to happen this way. This is a projection, right? We can change that. It doesn't have to be that way. If, you know, if we pay attention to the types of lighting we're using and the way we, when we turn things on and off, we can change that, you know, or at least help that, which is a good thing. So since I'm in control of the clicker right now, yes. <laughs> um, I don't think I need that if you want to just hold okay. it a second. So I, I, I teach, and so I think I project my voice decently. When I make more um, comments, we need to the recording. You need to the recording, oh my god, okay, right. <laughs> so um, if you look at the west there, I just wanted, um, uh, there's, there are less lights in the west. That's driven by population. What else is it driven by? Mountains. Mountains, geography, and? Public land. Yeah, all those things and water. If you read Mark Reisner's book, Cadillac Desert, he starts out, he's, fly yeah, not, he's flying over the western U.S. and there's a lot fewer lights. It's because there's no water, therefore there's far fewer people. So that's one of the things that works in our favor, but as you can see, we're figuring out the water thing, right, and, and, and the geography thing and people are coming in. Okay. Yeah, now I'm in charge. good point, excellent. So why don't you want to talk about the world view a little bit? No, I think you should. Okay. <laughs> so this is, um, this is another little world map here that shows some of the light. And you can tell where the heavy populations are. It's really easy. Here's the United States, of course. You've got Europe over here. You've got India. Um, then you go down to Africa. Look at that. Isn't that great? But they have great skies there. So 83% uh, of the population, like it says here, lives under light polluted skies. That's a lot. And, um, this just gives these these la that last slide and this one are from National Geographic. Um, so on the right there, you know, it's talking about unwanted glare from light. So you've got this light that's got the useful light that's pointing down. But what happens so often? You've got the bulbs that are just shooting light up in the sky where it's completely useless. Um, it's just causing light pollution, or it glares and bounces off and does different things. So we're going to look at that a little more in a little bit. Here's Las Vegas, look at this. Um, so it says, what is it there? The city directly over, persists from the city out to over 40 miles away, the light extends out. And I've heard you can see it from 200 miles in the air or two. So um, a lot of light pollution in places like that. So we're gonna talk about some of the reasons to protect the night sky. I'm gonna go over this really briefly first and then we're gonna go into some detailed examples. Um, and actually, I'll take the clicker here, so it's, I'm going to let you hold this for a minute. Um, so, we've got a variety of good reasons. The first one is astronomy. Who likes to look at the stars? Right, yay. Everybody raise your hands. <laughs> we have a big attachment to our skies. Our culture, our stories are told up in, this, in the sky and the stars, and it becomes very important to us in a lot of ways. Um, birds, there are over 200 species of birds that migrate across, um, the, across North America at night. So that's a lot of birds moving out there depending on darkness, plus a lot of other animals too. So, have you ever had tried to sleep and there's a bright light shining in your window? It's kind of hard. It, it affects our health and human health in a lot of different ways. And in addition, when you have dark skies, it's a good reminder that we're a part of something much bigger. It's not just planet Earth, we're this tiny little dot out there, and that's an important thing to remember as well. So, to go into these in a little more detail, um, astronomy is our, one of our oldest natural sciences. Um, you know, ancient civilizations looked at the stars, did stories about them, we've got Atlas holding up the sky here. We see ourselves reflected in the stars. We use our imagination and our wonder to, to see ourselves up there and, and think about where we are and who we are and, and where we belong. Um, and we need to, to continue to do that in the future, but to do that we've got to be able to see the stars in the sky. <coughs> this is another picture by Mike. This is taken at Rabbit Mountain. Um, it's on Highway 66, close to Lyons, if you've ever been there. And you can see the Milky Way there, but you can also see uh, the lights of Boulder to the south. So when, you, when we've been there doing astronomy programs, you can see to the west and the north and the east pretty well, but there's not much in the southern sky, even though we can see the Milky Way. 
So our culture, think about, what's this constellation? You want to point to that right there? What's that constellation right there in the middle of the bear? It's not, not really a constellation, but part of the constellation, right up here into the tail. What is that? The Big Dipper, right? Most everybody in the Northern Hemisphere knows about the Big Dipper. It's one of those things that everybody knows about. If they don't know a single other constellation, they kind of relate to the Big Dipper. And the Big Dipper's cool because you use those two stars at the end where the hero is, and it points you to Polaris, which is a North Star. So we call it the Big Dipper, and we feel very affectionate toward it. But it's not called that everywhere else. Is it anybody from England or have been to England? Do you know what's, what's it called there? It's the plow, like a plow in a field. In Germany, it's called a wagon. So there's different names for, you know, for that Big Dipper. The picture on the right is from the Navajo culture, and Polaris is seen as a campfire. And then the Big Dipper is part of a constellation called the First Man. And then Cassiopeia, the little W on the right, is what it's part of a constellation called the First Woman. And so since we spin underneath Polaris, North Star, it looks like all those constellations are, are going around Polaris. And so this kind of represents family around the campfire. So interesting how we connect to the stars in a lot of different ways. The National Park Service has been a big instigator in a lot of this in protecting the dark skies. Um, they've been doing this for quite a while. In fact, one of their slogans is, half the park is after dark, <laughs> which is pretty cool. And the nice thing about national parks is that there are, most of them are open 24 hours a day. So you can go anytime, and you can go at night, and you can see the skies. Um, it's a little harder to do that with our open spaces in Boulder County and Larimer County and Fort Collins because they all close at, at dark pretty much unless we have an astronomy event. But you can go to Rocky anytime you want and go ahead and see the skies. Back in the 60s, the national parks had what they called sidewalk astronomers. They just brought telescopes and set them out on the sidewalks and um, let people view the skies. And people started getting more interested in it as, as time went by. Recently, they did a survey where they asked visitors what was important to them, and 90% of them said they came and wanted to see dark skies in national parks. So many of the parks now have um, astronomy programs. Who's ever been to one at Rocky? You ran up there? During the summertime, like every other Friday, it's amazing. Um, they, we have amateur astronomers that come from Longmont and Denver and Boulder and Fort Collins and Loveland. They bring their scopes. There's usually, could be like 50 to 60 scopes out there and several hundred people that will come on one night in Upper Beaver Meadows. So it's a really nice way to, to see the skies and mingle with other fellow stargazers. So that's some astronomy stuff, but now if we switch to wildlife, um, I like this, what it says up here. Artificial light is another form of habitat loss. So we talk about how wildlife lose habitat, but light pollution is also part of that. Over half our species, 62% of our species are nocturnal. So they need darkness. 63% um, of mammals are nocturnal, and 64% of invertebrates. So quite a lot. Do you want to add anything to that before I go to the next? Yeah. So um, to bring this home, because um, we're light polluters, and I know that's, that's maybe not a great way to talk to an audience, but we're all to blame for this. Um, and so, okay, artificial light is another form of habitat loss. And I think it, but I think if we conceive of, habitat, of, of light pollution differently, we might start taking it a whole lot more seriously. So if I have a very bright light on my porch, I am damaging the animals who live close to my porch. Everything from an insect to a mouse to a fox, I'm damaging these creatures. I'm making it harder for them to succeed and flourish. I think that's the way we need to start thinking about it in terms of ourselves and in terms of um, our neighbors. The neighbors are the toughest ones. I think all of you could go, OK, I need to turn off my light. Um, how do you go tell your neighbor, turn off your light? Um, that's really difficult. I'd love to have a conversation with you all about your strategies in terms of telling neighbors to turn off their lights. But light pollution is something we can really do something about light pollution. And if we talk about it and think about it as another 
form of, you know, of artificial light is another form of habitat loss, I think we might take it more seriously. It's not just leaving a light on because it's convenient or we think we feel more safe. Um, we're, we're damaging an ecosystem, the ecosystem in your backyard, my backyard, our backyard. Okay. So we're going to talk about some of these critters and how they like the darkness. So this first one, this is a little beetle. Does anybody know what this is? I didn't ever hear it. It's a firefly. This is a little firefly or a lightning bug. We always call them lightning bugs when I was growing up. So fireflies are so interesting because they have this little chemical they produce in their body that gives the light that they use to communicate with each other and um, to find a mate or to establish territory. And who remembers chasing lightning bugs when you were a little kid? Yeah. <laughs> Putting them in a jar, watching them flash and letting them go. And you know, you don't see them as much anymore. So the thing is, they always knew, scientists knew that they, on a full moon, you wouldn't see a lot of fireflies because they need darkness. But now with light pollution, it's even harder to see them. And we're gonna do a little illustration of how that works. So I need the kids to come help me for a second. So can you come up here? I'm gonna get you to help me do this. Let's see if I can just clip this on for a second. Okay. All right, you guys are going to, this thing does not want to stay on my shoulder. It's not, it's not, it's not going to stay. Okay, so you guys are going to be fireflies, okay? So, it's this back here. Okay. So I'm going to give each of you one of these to hold. We're going to put it back in the bag and we're done. But um, this has a little light, so when you press it, see what happens? Okay. So I'm going to hand you each one of these to use, and I'm going to show you what we're going to do with them here in a second. See how this works. Yeah. Okay. We've got lots of good fireflies. All right, so first of all, <clears throat> I want you guys just to, to push your little lights on. You're a firefly, you're trying to communicate here. Push your little lights on. It's a little hard to see these in here, right? Because it's kind of bright. You can see it, but it's not real bright. So we're gonna have them turn the lights off in the back. All right? All right, now let's flash your lights. You can move around. You can move around like your little fireflies, okay? Just move around. We're trying to find each other. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good job. All right, come back up here, fireflies. Now, I want to tell you one other cool thing. There are lots of species of fireflies in the world, and there's one in the Great Smoky Mountains that flash together. So this is what we're going to do this time. I'm going to say, one, two, three, go. And when I say go, you flash together, okay? One, two, three, go. One, two, three, go. One, two, three. Go. Raise your hands up, please. <laughs> that is pretty cool, isn't it? So those fireflies are special because they flash together. But they need darkness, right? To communicate. So good job. All right. We're gonna put all our fireflies back in here. We can have the lights back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the lights on. Yeah. All right, good job. I if I can get this thing to come back on. Oh, I just think I hit B on the keyboard. Okay. And we need our pictures back. We're trying. <laughs> Patience. Uh, around Fort Collins. Oh, yeah? If you would like. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, I'll just mention this while we're getting that back up. And this is brand new research, and we still need to do a lot more to double check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, there we go. Oh, there we go. But it seems like there might be a correlation between too much light and the birds that carry West Nile disease. Oh. Oh. That the birds stay contagious for about twice as long 
when they are in areas where there's a lot of extra light. And of course, if the birds stay contagious for twice as long, then they could be spreading it for longer. So that's the latest news um, that we uh, have been studying with Parks and Wildlife up in Fort Collins. Cool. Nice. Thank you. So the next one I want to talk about, this is one of my favorites, is the dung beetle. So dung beetles, what do dung beetles do? They go to a pile of steaming poop and they get it and they roll it in a little ball and they try to get it away from there as fast as they can and they take it to their nest for their babies. And this may be gross, but it's part of that whole recycling thing of nature. You know, it's got to work that way. So, um, so what the dung beetles do, they do that and they've got to get this ball and they're rolling on top of it and they're kind of all backwards and everything. They'll grab a mate and take her with them and, and then they've got to get away in a straight line from that pile of poop as fast as they can. Because if they don't, some other dung beetle is going to take their prize. So they have to be able to go back in a straight line. Well, scientists have kind of known for, for a long time that beetles and some other in, insects use, um, it's called um, symmetric polarized light from the sun and the moon to kind of guide themselves. So that, you know, the angle of light kind of guides them to go in straight lines and be able to get away. But and they noticed they would use it in the day and also at night because there's a little that comes off the moon. But then they would see these beetles doing this when there was no moon. It was dark. So we're trying to figure out what they were using. And they did this study in South Africa where the, the Milky Way is just gorgeous and it's very dark. And so what they did, you will love this, is they put little cardboard hats on the beetles <laughs> so they couldn't see the sky. And so when the beetles got on these little piles of poop and tried to roll them away, they were going all over the place and they couldn't figure out how to go in a straight line. And, and, they, and so what they were doing is getting the light off of the Milky Way. They were following that light of the Milky Way to get away and go in a straight line. And just to be sure, it wasn't just that they had the hats on, they had some control beetles that had little clear hats. And the ones that had the little clear hats could, could go in a straight line and they could get away. So, pretty interesting. And they think moths and things like that may use some of the same techniques. And speaking of that, moths, of course, get very confused with light. You've obviously seen them around light bulbs. Um, if you think about your little moth and you've got the moon and the stars out there, and then you've got maybe light from the trees you're following, it's kind of all kind of far away. But if you've got this hugely bright light right in front of you, it's very confusing for the moths. Did you have a question back there? Did you have a question? Absolutely. In fact, I'm going to skip ahead because I have that on here. And we're going to come back to something with this other stuff in here. So I'm going to go here real quick while you're talking about that, and we'll go back. You are absolutely right. This is from Florida. Um, the little, what happens is, like you were saying, that the eggs are laid in the sand by the mother, and the little turtles hatch, and they use the light reflected from the moon and the stars off the water to know to go to the ocean. But when you've got these little communities that are right next to the beach like that, there's all this light there, and the turtles go the wrong way. So this was actually volunteers that followed the turtles and mapped out where they went. Um, and when they went into town, and obviously they didn't make it. Um, if, you know, if they don't get to the water, they get eaten by predators and all this kind of stuff. Um, fortunately, there's a lot of people helping turtles today. They've changed a lot of the lighting in, the, in a lot of these areas. And there's volunteers that go out and help the turtles get to the ocean. So people are trying to make a difference and help, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's another animal that's affected by that. So I'm going to go back to this. This is a little indigo bunting. Um, indigo buntings migrate between North and South America, and they migrate at night. So for many years, people knew that they were kind of using the stars to migrate. And back in the 60s already, they did a really cool experiment with these birds. They took them, and, they, and this, it's much more involved than this, but I'll just do kind of a quick recap. So they, have, they put them in a planetarium, basically. And what they did is, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with what we were talking about, with the Big Dipper, and it points to Polaris. So what they did is, when it was time for the birds to migrate south, they were in the planetarium, and they would try to fly away from Polaris, the North Star. 
And then when they moved Polaris around inside the planetarium, no matter where it was, the birds would try to fly away from Polaris, regardless of whether it was actually in the north or not. So that was pretty cool. But then about 10 years later or so, they go, well, maybe it's not just Polaris. Maybe they're flying away from the pattern of the stars. So as we're spinning underneath Polaris, you know, during the course of the night, the Big Dipper and Cassiopeia look like they're going around Polaris and you get this pattern of, scar of stars going in a circle. So what they did is they put the birds in there again and moved it around. The birds would fly away from that. But then they readjusted the stars in the planetarium so that they would go around Betelgeuse instead of the North Star. And Betelgeuse, of course, is in Orion. It's in the southern sky. So as the, you know, the spinning there, and they put the birds in there, it's trying to migrate. Where do you think they went? away from Betelgeuse. So they treated it like the North Star. And no matter where it was in the planetarium, they would fly away from Betelgeuse. So they were looking at that pattern of stars in the sky to figure out how to migrate. But you kind of have darkness to see, them, to see the stars. So birds in general, we mentioned earlier, as they're migrating, um, there's like I think that I read 10,000 birds are killed every year in New York City, just hitting buildings and lights coming through glass and stuff like that. The city of Toronto some years ago started this big uh, campaign called Lights Out Toronto, and they just told people, stop leaving your lights on. When you leave the office, when you leave your building, turn your lights off. And there were a lot less birds being killed and really helped out a lot. Now I'm going to let Becky explain some of this stuff with birds because it's really pretty cool. I want to go back first. For kidding, okay. The insect thing. So a um, number of you might have read a year ago an article in the New York Times. I need the mic. Oh. <laughs> I'm not being recorded. I'm not being recorded. Um, <laughs> so you might have read uh, a year ago in the New York Times magazine, uh, uh, Insect Apocalypse. And that's what's happening with insects right now. So this writer talks about driving down the road and there aren't as many dead bugs on the windshield. And it's, it's a very anecdotal sort of experiment, right? Not an experiment at all. But where are all the dead bugs in Iowa, in Nebraska, where they, they should, there should be a bunch of dead bugs? There's far fewer, apparently, dead bugs it's because there's far fewer insects. So there's lots of things killing insects, pesticides, habitat loss. Um, bird, uh, insects, of course, are very important. They pollinate our food. Bees, honeybees, bumblebees, um, butterflies, they're all pollinators. Uh, birds, bats. Um, but one of the things that's killing insects, and maybe not at the level of pesticides, but certainly killing insects is light pollution. So again, it's that ecosystem concern that uh, my lights, my unnecessary lights, are unnecessarily killing bugs. Some lights are necessary. Some insects are going to have going to have to die because you're going to need that light. But the unnecessary lights—that's something to really think about, right? Because um, we really need these bugs, um, and bugs are a barometer of how healthy our general ecosystem is. So there's that. Um, well, going back to birds, remember that birds eat insects. So you like birds that eat dinner. They eat their dinner. Their dinner is bugs. Um, so. This particular collection, a couple of slides I saw at the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, and I actually wrote them and got permission to show these slides. I think they're unique. So here, I, I'm, I'm not going to use the pointer. On the left, you see a tree, right? You see a, a tree and the sunlight flying, and shining through. That's what a bird sees, and for millions of years, birds have used light as a way to navigate through forest, and light is their passageway, right? So map that on to the photo on the right. Light is not a passageway. Light is a glass window. And you're going to die, bird, when you smash into that. And they do at huge, horrible numbers. You said 10,000 in New York. Right, right. The number that I have read in a number of different places is anywhere worldwide, anywhere from 300 million to 1 billion birds a year are dying because of light pollution. That comes from the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada and the Sierra Club is published on this as well. That's a really huge number. 
If you care about birds, you need to really think about those big, beautiful, I like it too, you know, you see the downtown lights of Denver, it's so pretty, those skyscrapers, but they're deadly. <laughs> they really are, they're deadly. And there's other reasons to be really concerned about them. But so anyway, so you see this mapping, what the bird sees and what you know, a building represents. It couldn't be worse for a bird in terms of their understanding of what the passageways are. And you're, we're going back to your turtles. Okay. You're and we're going to talk. We're going to talk about human beings a, a little bit now, right? So, um, so think if you think about our evolution as human beings uh, for millions of years, we're, we're dependent on light too. So, what we found about light pollution is it, it affects all living creatures, some more than others, but it affects all living creatures. It affects us too. And so you brought up insomnia, right? Um, I don't know how many times. I, I'm, I'm very sensitive to light. Um, I'm the person who sticks towels underneath the door at a motel, and you know, so it can be totally dark. And I actually just bring eye shades and things. I'm that person. I need to have total darkness when I sleep. It turns out you're actually probably that person, too. Apparently, all of us are affected by light pollution. Some of us can put up with it better than others. But we need dark. We need darkness. So light pollution has been uh, associated with uh, depression, with anxiety, with heart disease. And that's a connection I don't fully understand, but with heart disease and with cancer. So you see this study that's been then with certain types of cancer, right? So women living in 147 different communities in Israel where it was bright enough to read a book outside at midnight had a 73% higher risk of developing breast cancer than, in those er than those in areas with the least amount of artificial lighting, right? So if you think about this, this has class issues attached to it. Who's working in the middle of the night at graveyard shifts with bright lights on in whatever building they're protecting or 24-7 business of some sort? Um, so that person who's working there, their health is, is in, at higher risk than mine because I'm usually asleep you know, at 1 a.m., I hope, right? Um, so this has real consequences to think about in terms of, in terms of human health. So, um, and, and think about in the summertime, right? So I have wonderful neighbors, I like them a lot. Um, in the summertime I want to have the cool, we don't have air conditioning in our house, I want the cool night Colorado air to flow through my house and cool my house and I want to sleep with the window open, right? My neighbors have really bright lights, and so the light is shining in, and that's a real problem. And it, it's a problem for all of us. It's a bigger problem for me because I really can't sleep if I got light coming in the room, right? But it's a problem for all of us. So it, that's um, a piece of education that we all need to work on, um, working with our neighbors. I haven't had the courage yet to talk to my nice neighbors and said, can you turn off your lights? <laughs> Again, I'd like to hear some suggestions on how to do it tactfully, but... Um, Bring a bottle of wine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, um, so the American Medical Association is um, adopting a policy recognizing exposure to excessive light has consequences. I won't read that entire thing aloud to you, but you know, it isn't just environmental groups and people who like to stargaze who um, see a real problem with light pollution. The AMA does, and it's something to, to pay attention to. Um, I won't, you want to go through those? It's just kind of, yeah, it's just kind of common sense, you know, recommendations that the Medical Association um, established, you know, like using um, the warmer LED lights, um, you know, controlling the blue rich environment. We'll talk more about that light stuff in a little bit. And using uh, 3000 Kelvin or less or lower lighting for outdoor lighting. We'll talk about that more in a minute so you'll understand that more. So um, I inserted this in here. I'm an activist in climate change. I feel this is the number one problem, the worst problem, most dangerous problem that humanity faces. So light pollution contributes mightily to climate change. Um, so 44 million metric tons of carbon dioxide could be kept out of our atmosphere if we simply followed dark skies, International Dark Sky Association recommendations in regard to lighting. Um, the Sierra Club reckons that America is wasting anywhere from 20 to 50 percent, depending on the area, anywhere from 20 to 50 percent of our electricity at night is simply wasted. The lights aren't necessary. 
wasted. That comes to $10 billion, at least $10 billion, that both you know, federal government and private citizens are spending on light that's not necessary. That's a lot of money that could be used for education, paying off student loans, infrastructure. I don't know what you want to see the federal government in America do. That's $10 billion that is literally um, going up into the atmosphere because the vast majority of it is being, the electricity is being produced by coal-fired power plants or natural gas-fired power plants. So that contributes a lot to climate change. One of the, it's one of the easiest ways to address climate change. Turn off your lights at night. Use less electricity, but turn off your lights at night. And when you do that, you're helping your own little local ecosystem. Your neighbors are sleeping better and liking you better, right? Um, I'm sure they like you, but they're gonna like you even more if you turn off your lights at night. Um, and uh, and you're, you're, you're addressing climate change. And the other thing, if you don't have electric strips where you can turn off your computers, turn off your TVs, a TV, even when turned off, is sucking up 40% of the energy that it needs to run, just when it's sitting there, because it's always ready for you to turn it on. You don't have to wait at all. It just jumps on for you, right? If you can be patient for three minutes, um, you can save a lot of energy. In any case, climate change is huge, and it's, it's worth pointing out in regard to its relationship with light pollution. Okay. So what is light pollution? Let's talk about what that is. Um, there's different types of light pollution. One of them is sky glow. That's when you're seeing all of the, you know, city lights show up on the horizon and it kind of, you know, obliterates the stars. You have light trespass, which it's pretty obvious. What does that mean? It's going where it's not supposed to go, right? It's trespassing. So instead of lighting up a little area of the street, it's going way beyond that. Or like you were saying, your neighbor's light that comes into your yard where you really don't want it. So that's what light trespass is. And then we have light glare. So quickly, I want you to look at these pictures, these pictures, and tell me how many of those four is there a guy standing under the light? It's all four. So what happens is these two on the left, the light is very glaring and very bright. People always think, oh, the brighter the light, you know, the safer it's going to be. But it's so bright, you think about how your eyes work. When your eyes have a lot of light coming into you, what happens to your pupils? They get really small, right? And then it's really hard to see in the darkness. And then all these shadows develop and you can't see what's happening. The lights on the left are just kind of pointed down. They're a lot, you know, they're not glaring. They're a lot less. You can still see where you need to be. And you can also see around. You can see people standing underneath there, um, which you wouldn't see with the glaring lights. This is one of my favorite examples. This is on a house with a big glaring light. I'm sure somebody thought, oh, this is going to be really nice and safe because we've got a huge light on there. But look what happens when you cover that up with your hand. Do you see the guy standing there in the fence? He's standing in the top one, too, but you can't see him. So all these little shadows develop and stuff, and um, your, your vision is actually worse when you have glaring lights like that than if you have a more subdued light. So that's kind of amazing when you look at those pictures. Um, oh, yeah, go ahead. So when you can test this yourself when you're driving home, I'm, gonna, I, I, I'm driving back to Boulder tonight, so I'll certainly be aware of this. You're driving and um, cars coming towards you, you are temporarily blinded. And you all, as drivers, you all know, focus on the white line, focus on this over here as the cars are coming towards you. I ride my bike a lot. I commute in Boulder. Um, I unfortunately live two miles from, from work. And um, this is a really dangerous time for me on my bike because as I'm riding along on my bike and cars are coming toward me, I can't see. And I can quickly do this experiment myself, cover up, the, try to cover, and I'm doing it so I can see where I'm going, cover up the glare of the cars and still keep my hands on the handlebars. There's not enough hands. But this is something you can, you're very aware of. You automatically and unconsciously and you do it because of this glare effect. We think we're safer when we have these bright lights, but we're not. Um, this is a study from Iowa that they did some years ago. And first of all, this is a couple of slides I stole from their presentation. But um, so some pointers that are interesting about this is a lot of break-ins occur during the day. 
when people can see what they're doing. People always think it happens at night, but a lot of them happen during the day. Um, all those overpowering lights create actually, you know, glare and stuff that makes it difficult to see what's happening. When you have a building that's lit a lot, it makes it easy for criminals to watch your building and see what's going on to plan things, actually, and, you know, instead of it being dark. And also the motion lights a lot of times, they come on and off so much that people don't pay attention. So the interesting part about this was, um, this was in 2004, I think, they, the city of Des Moines decided to change all of their lights to a lower form of light and better form of lighting. And they had these dire predictions that all the crime was going to increase when they did that. And instead, they had a 3.5% drop in the Ellis Burglary and Robert once they changed their, their lights. So, kind of interesting. Um, LEDs, who likes LEDs, right? Are they, are they good or bad? Do you think LEDs are good or bad? They save a lot of electricity. <laughs> They're good in a lot of ways. I mean, they use a lot less energy, right? There, there's a lot of good reasons to use LEDs, uh, but it depends on the type of LEDs you're using. We have a lot of blue light waves in our daytime, you know, daytime light. At night, there's very, very little blue light. Well, especially when LEDs first came out, there was a ton of blue light in those, those bulbs, that, that really bright, intense, you know, white light that you would see. And that's the worst thing we have at night. And it really is, you know, disturbs all the melatonin we're creating to try to sleep and all those health issues that, that Becky was talking about. And so a lot of us, you know, switch the amber or red, the, the warmer lights, which is very helpful in a lot of ways. Like, for instance, we have a night light in our bedroom so we don't kill ourselves trying to go to the bathroom. But it's a red light. You know, you can still see, but it doesn't disturb your sleep, which is nice. So here's the interesting thing, too. So we know blue light is interferes with sleep and is kind of harmful to humans. Well, in the North Sea, close to England, some years ago, they had put red lights out because they didn't want to disturb the birds there. And, um, well, then it turned out that a certain species of birds that the red lights were actually harmful to. And so that red lights actually harm them. So Hawaii's committed to that, and they put just blue lights out because they thought, well, that would be better. But then they had species of birds that the red lights were, I mean, blue lights were harmful to. And then you think about, like, in Florida with the turtles, they put the amber lights out a lot because those are good and don't hurt the sea turtles. But then the dune mice are harmful to that. So the best thing you can do is just turn the lights off. <laughs> so if you don't need them, you just turn them off. It makes it easier. Um, here's some other pictures. This is from Grand Canyon National Park. Back to the national parks again. This was a housing area or cabin area here. That, this is the way it used to look with all these intensely bright lights. And they changed a lot of their lighting. So look at the difference. Um, you still have plenty of lights to walk around and see what you need to do there, but it's not shining in the sky. And, and creating all the glare. So there's, there's the parks in general are leaders in a lot of this, but there's a lot of things that communities can do that are similar. Um, this comes from the uh, Boulder County um, lighting guidelines, just you know, talking about what's good and what's bad as far as lighting. But if you look at the blue lighting part, um, you know, it's directing light downward, it's not going up into the sky, it's not glaring. Um, you don't want it trespassing, um, and they're quite, you know, it's cost efficient. All these things help make a difference between good and bad lighting. So these, this is a picture from our house in, we live just north of here, about two miles. And these light fixtures are the type you can get. You can get them at Home Depot or Lowe's, and they're pretty easy to install. And so the one on the right there is on the front of our house. We have several of those, and we don't even turn on unless you have somebody come over to visit so they can find our house. But then when they're on, they're just pointing downwards and they're not creating that, you know, upward glare and, and obnoxious light. And then we have one that's on all the time in the front, so it has a yellow light. And uh, it's very subdued. So these are easy things that, that can be done in your own, at your own house. And it's not very expensive. So. When you go to the store, you can find lights that are marked with the IDA symbol, which is the International Dark Sky Association. And um, those are the ones that they are recommending that you can use. Now, this is the part that I have a hard time even understanding, because this is very confusing to me. 
But the takeaways from this are, let's say, first of all, when you talk about you know, the color temperature of LEDs, it has nothing to do with how the bulb fills, because the bulbs do not feel hot. They don't produce heat like that. But the cool lights have a higher numbers, and the warm lights have the lower numbers. So the warm lights are like the yellow, red, orange. The cool lights are the blue or greenish tinges. Um, and then anything that the uh, International Dark Sky Association recognizes anything with 3,000 K or less. So LEDs can go anywhere from 2,700 to 6,500. So some of those you know, big signs on the side of the freeway that are glaring at you and you almost run off the road and you see them probably have pretty high levels of um, cool light stuff in it. So just look for warm lights and then know that the lower the number is, the better. That's the takeaway. In Boulder County, we, the last five years, we've done a dark sky monitoring study. And actually before that, I used to work for the city of Fort Collins, where it is. And about seven or eight years ago at least, we started working with the uh, National Park Service Night Skies and Sounds Office, which is in Fort Collins. It's a national office, and they um, take the lead on you know, helping the International Dark Sky Association in establishing dark sky places. So they were doing some monitoring in Fort Collins. We started working with them there. And so when I went down to Boulder County, we expanded that. Now we do this all along the front range. And so what you do is you take these little meters, they're called sky quality meters, you just pull them up above your head like this, and you click them, and it gives you a reading of how dark the sky is. So there's, you can see how that works there. This is at Highland Valley Ranch off of Highway 36. And uh, you can see the Milky Way shining there through the trees. So it helps document the dark skies. Um, so we have some, you know, something to look at in the future and see how we're doing. And also, again, shows, demonstrates how open spaces and protected areas protect the dark skies as well. So it's interesting when you try to look at these readings because they're exponential. It's like if you think about a 7.1 earthquake is way bigger than a 6.8. You know, it's, it's, the numbers aren't that far apart, but it's, it's hugely different. So here, like a 22 reading is on a moonless night where there's no pollution. 17 is like New York City or something. So 17 is 100 times more light than a reading at 22. So it gives you kind of an idea of what those are. Now look down here, you see Trail Ridge Road. I had a reading 2163. Substone Prairie, Prairie before. Yes, up between Fort Collins and Wyoming. It's very dark there. Um, and Caribou and Mud Lake are behind Netherland. All of those have really nice readings. Look, they're just under 22. So it's really um, pretty impressive that we have places like that. Here's a little graph. Oops that just gives you a visual. You see Las Vegas down here at the end, where it's very, very light. What's next to Las Vegas? The Pearl Street Mall. <laughs> so a lot of light in the Pearl Street Mall. And the other thing you've got, Great Basin National Park in Nevada, this which is out of 22. Uh, you've got Rocky Mountain National Park, and you've got all this other stuff in between. But just kind of gives you an idea of the variation of, um, you know, of light to darkness. So we put together a map and we, we took readings, not only in our open space, but in all the cities and towns of Boulder County. And um, let me see that pointer for a second. Thank you. So obviously you can tell where the towns are. You've got the lighter blue dots and the darker the blue dots are um, is where it's dark. We've got, there's Walker Ranch down here. It's Spatassa Reserve. This is a, a caribou mud lake, but then the Netherland traffic circle is very light. We've got a lot of lights there. You wouldn't think that would be true, but it is. Um, we've got High Valley Ranch and Hall Ranch up here. There's Rabbit Mountain. And then you've got all the towns down here on the plains that are much more light. So I do have paper copies of these maps here, too. If you want to come and look at them afterwards, and just if you're interested, you can look at them closer. Um, but it's just kind of a nice visual to see where we have lights and what we're trying to do. The town of Louisville is actually actively trying to create some light ordinances and, and, and improve their lighting in their town. It's a grassroots thing. There's people in the town um, that are interested in doing that. So that's kind of cool. Yes, and Bertha is for sure. Bertha is great. Bertha is a great example. Um, and 
my team wants to say something about that or what's going on with that? We updated our endurance credit ordinance in 2018, and we have limited fee lights. Our logo lights and new construction for 3,000 Kelvin. And all dark sky compatible, all the new <laughs> subdivisions are compliant as far as I know, except I just talked to a gentleman here tonight that says he hates his neighbor's lights, so that's you a good one. Yeah. To him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The town has hired an enforcement official and even provided a person with a van so they can drive around and, and see what we have. One of the key things we have done is limited the light to 3,000 Kelvin. Also fully shielded, as well as we have a limit to light trespass. So you can only shine 10 feet into your neighbor's property with only one lumen thing to live in. So you cannot <coughs> keep people awake at night by shining bright. That would be an offense, right? Municipal offense. <laughs> uh, so you don't have to be in a big city to make a difference. A little town like Bertha can do a lot. This is Will Karspik, our mayor. Do you think I'm to who uh, brought it to the board's attention and uh, guided us through this? And, and it, the difference is noticeable between the new developments that came in before the ordinance and afterwards. And even compliments I've received uh, of just how unique it is in some of our new developments that it's a little bit darker. Um, it goes a long way, and I think it hits a lot of different points uh, beyond sky glow and stuff is where we started into the observatory. But um, overall, the people are a little bit happy. Great, thank you. And if anybody wants to read about it, it is on the net, on the Worth It website, under the development code. There is a special chapter for light pollution and dark sky ordinance. So any developer or any homeowner can read the ordinance. Nothing secret there. Great. Okay. Just a few more images to share with you that are kind of interesting. Um, the National Park Service has this really cool camera called a charge couple device camera, and it does this big 360 view of the sky. It takes about an hour to you know to put the whole image together. This one was done at um, on Trail Ridge Road at Rainbow Curve back in 2008. Um, so, you know, it's dark. Remember we had those numbers from Trail Ridge. It's dark. You can see the Milky but you can still see the half glow coming up from the front range there in the east. And the top one is from Soapstone Prairie. So, there you've got beautiful dark skies. But you've got Fort Collins and Denver lights and stuff coming, are visible there on the horizon. And this bottom one is from Caribou Ranch by Netherland. Um, and again, you've got older lights coming up and in the east there. We were actually sitting right down where that truck is <laughs> when he was doing the whole camera thing. But just kind of an interesting way to look at the sky, too. This is a fun, um, I don't know how to, let's see. How to, can you help me get, I don't know how to start this. I'll do it. Just tell me when you want to Okay. Yeah, go ahead. This is from Pawnee Views. Mike Lore, the guy who spoke before, did this little video of the skies at Pawnee Views, which is up north of, uh, kind of east of Fort Collins. And look at that. It's like gorgeous with the Milky Way. When did you do that? A couple years ago. It's a couple. Oh, yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was fairly recent, within the last few years. And so this next one, this is up at Caribou Ranch. I want you to watch this and tell me what you think all the lights are in the sky here. What are those lights going by? Airplanes. 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 Yeah. It's right in the path of Amber's flight plans. So uh, those are all airplanes flying over. I thought they were meteors the first time I saw it. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. It could be. Yeah, I'm not sure to tell you the truth. So anyway, just some nice, really, you know, wonderful views of the sky there. So this is Los Angeles here, a picture of Los Angeles, so totally bright. And so some of you may remember they had a big earthquake there in 1994. And when they had the earthquake, they lost power. So all of a sudden they get all these 911 calls that people saw this giant silvery cloud in the sky and they were terrified. And it was the Milky Way. <laughs> they just say they've seen the Milky Way before. So um, it's just 
a reminder that you know, there's so many reasons that night skies are important. You know, we've got the wildlife, we've got human health, we've got astronomy, but also, once again, to remind us that when you look up in the sky, you're reminded that we're this tiny speck. And that it's just a good reminder to take care of our own Earth because we forget that we can't look up and see the stars and remember her, how far away everything else is and how small we are in the whole realm of galaxies in the universe and all that. So, kind of a nice little reminder and a comfort in a way. Um, so, what can you do? You can change your outdoor lighting fixtures on your house. Um, you can turn off lighting indoors and outdoors when you don't need it. Um, you can share what you know and what you've learned with other people. I brought a whole lot of brochures from the Dark Sky Association that are in the back on the counter about all the various little topics we're talking about. There's some old brochures. There's some information there about the lighting. They're reviewing Boulder County. There's a sheet that has some examples of light you can get and purchase. Um, if you want to know more about that, there's the web address, but you can just Google International Dark Sky Association. And you know, you can ask one of us or somebody else here from the observatory that knows about this stuff to do a presentation for your club or your group. And we're happy to share the news because we're passionate about it. So, the best thing is just bust a light and enjoy the night. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It's completely clear, and you can see if field juice is blown up. So, okay. Yeah. So, it looks like we'll be having good use through the telescope. It's windy. It. It's somewhat windy. But it is a bit windy, okay. Um, it's not strong. So, let's just take one or two questions and we can stay here up yeah. front and talk further with people. Okay. I know. So, are there any questions before you go through the telescopes? Oh, I see a hand back there. Um, do you think we're going to be able to see the Milky Way, maybe? Tonight? Tonight? You can see a piece of it. Yep. Yep. Yep, we'll be able to see part of the Milky Way tonight. Well, um, do you want to, how, how do you want to split up the group among the telescopes? Uh, yeah, right now we only have the 18 inch set up. We can set up the 24. Ted, can you set up the 24? Okay. And I'd like to have one, at least one helper with Ted on the 24. Okay, so while they are getting the telescopes set up. Down the field with them. I'll open it back up. Before we go, I wanted to finish up. Can you go up to the I want to mention two things. First of all, um, we have a representative from the International Dark Sky Association here. Yeah. And so feel free to ask him to Richard. Yes. Yeah, Richard with questions. And you brought up the excellent point of what what if my neighbor has a really bright light fixture? Um, Believe it or not, the International Dark Sky Association has a good neighbor guide with information about how you can talk to your neighbors if you have a concern. And I myself have done that, and what I've found has been the most effective thing is to say, could I buy you a new yeah. porch light? And say, you know, here's some you know, pictures of, of different ones. Sure. Would you be willing to pick one out? And when they got to, to choose something, they were like, okay. <laughs> Trying to get somebody to figure out what to buy and to go do it is a lot harder, but if you just offer to say, hey, can I take care of it, a lot of times people are, you know, they, they want to have light in a particular place, but they don't need light going clear to your windows, and they, they do want to be good neighbors, and that that's an easy way to accomplish that. And the other thing I wanted to ask about is when is our next volunteer training? When is our next volunteer training? Is February? It's a Saturday. Third or fourth Saturday in February. Okay. 
And um, while we mentioned that we like money, we also are very grateful for the meaningful donations of time, which is what keeps the observatory running. If we're an all-volunteer organization, and you can help out in all kinds of ways, and it's a lot of fun. So thank you very much for being here. Does anybody else have any final announcements? Okay, well enjoy looking through the telescopes and thank you guys for coming.